Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Emily and I talk a lot about Salesforce. Today we're gonna to be covering the top five topics that I would study to help me pass the App Builder certification. So before we dive into the App Builder certification top five, I wanna talk a little bit about this exam. This exam was kinda of tricky. Um, the place of this exam in the Salesforce ecosystem is to be a bridge between admin and developer. So where you can know the differences between um, an admin task versus a developer task generally. Sometimes lines might get a little confused because sometimes it's a lot easier to code a solution than to create some really super complex flow that breaks half the time. <laughs> and so while Salesforce would say, oh no, just use flows. And especially on the exam, they might say, oh no, just use flows. It might actually be easier to have a developer do this and then fix it down the line if Salesforce creates a native functionality or a better functionality for that. So that's my one little gripe. I, again, this certification is just the bridge between developers and admins. So this exam was one of the longer exams. So where you might have an associate exam that has a choose, like a 40 question, choose one out of three answers. This one was a little bit more difficult and I would say pretty difficult because there are a lot of intricacies when it comes to Salesforce functionality. This one uh, I believe was a choose one out of four and you might see a choose two out of five or a choose three out of five. Not quite sure on those but I know that definitely the choose one out of four was the majority of the questions. This one is going to focus a lot on automations. It's going to focus a lot on some of the admin tools. I would say that this is like 60% some of the same material that you covered on the admin exam and the rest of the 40% is going to be development lifecycle and some of the intricacies that you didn't dive into as much with the admin exam. So this one is actually a fairly good to pick up after you get the admin exam. It might take a couple tries. It took a couple tries for me to be able to pass it. So once I understood uh, a few key things <laughs> on the exam and the material a lot better and I got more comfortable on the exam, I was able to pass it with flying colors. So who is this good for? I would recommend the certification be one of your first few certifications regardless of if you are on the Salesforce admin or the Salesforce developer path. I think this is great for both to understand some basic ground rules when it comes to admin tasks versus developer tasks. And so that would be pretty important. One thing I do wanna mention is that on the exam, you want to answer these questions like Salesforce would want you to answer these questions. So what I mean by that is you might have um, a scenario where you need to automate something that is very complex and you might be able to come up with a flow that is very complex and it breaks half the time, but you're able to do the task with just clicks and using flows. Whereas you can have a developer develop it and it take like less than a day of work and it does the thing and it does the thing perfectly. In this scenario, you would think you would wanna go with the developer, but on the exam, you're gonna wanna go with the flow because this is how Salesforce wants you to answer the question um, per the exam and per the ground rules of the exam. The ground rules of this exam are um, clicks over code. And so anything that you can do with clicks, anything that you can do with configuration, with flows, um, then you're gonna to wanna to choose that before you choose any developer options. So that was one of those things where <laughs> I, on the exam, I could have done a lot better on the first few tries if I had understood the ground rules per se on this exam. Let's go ahead and jump into the first one. And this is going to be know the differences of the different automation tools. When I took this exam, workflow rules and process builders were still the gold standard. Flows had just barely come out and so they were still working through a few bugs when it came to um, the first couple years of that product being live. Um, now they've kind of reined back in the flow, the workflow roles, and they've reined back in the process builder, but it takes a couple of years for Salesforce exams to catch up with the current uh, features that they have. And so you may see these on the exam. You may see workflow rules and process builders on the exam. And what I would have to say is that um, go with the most simple answer. So if you can do something with a workflow or you could have done something with a workflow rule, but you can also do it with a flow, choose the workflow rule because it's a more simple 
product. It's a more simple feature. Um, I wouldn't study too much about workflow rules or process builders. Just understand what they can and can't do, and you should be good to go there. But definitely study the other uh, process automation tools that they have. There's others. There's approval processes. So of course you have flows. You have lead assignment rules. You have case assignment rules. You have case escalation rules. You have um, some minor, I would call that minor automation features when it comes to cases and leads that may come in handy when it comes to process automation. And so if you have the question of should I use a case assignment rule or should I use a flow? In that scenario, Salesforce would want you to pick the case assignment rule because it is the more simple answer. But what this question is trying to get at and what these questions are trying to get out on the exam is really going to be about when you'd want to use clicks versus code, where that line is, um, and really going with the most simple answer leaning towards configuration rather than development. All right, number two is going to be sandboxes and how they fit in the Salesforce development lifecycle. I call it the SLD, SDLC and they typically call it the application lifecycle development or application development lifecycle. One of those things. It's a little late here um, when I'm filming this. But essentially, you're going to want to know, hey, you've got developer, you've got developer pro, you have like, um, I can't, I think it's like a partial copy sandbox is what they're called. And then you have a full copy sandbox. Each of these sandboxes has their place in the Salesforce development lifecycle as far as testing and as far as development go. And you're gonna wanna fit that into the application lifecycle. So typically the basic developer sandbox is going to be for configuration. And so you're gonna wanna use that for developing a initial solution. Then you may want to use a developer pro, which has a little bit more storage for some testing of development features. So if you are coding, this is when you're going to want to use that. You might also want to use this for a different type of testing, depending on the testing that you'll be using. So a partial copy, I thought it was a half copy, but no, that's what, just what I thought in my mind. A partial copy, so it's going to have a lot of your configuration, but not all of your data within your Salesforce instance. So this one is going to be for user acceptance testing is typically what this is going to be used for and what they'll want to have you use it for on the exam. And so, that's typically what those two match up to. And then finally, you're gonna have a full copy. This is going to be all of the configuration that you have in your production org. And this is going to be for a test deployment typically, and maybe some last minute testing. So you're gonna to want to deploy it and see how deployment goes in this full copy sandbox from your partial copy to your full copy and see how that goes to make sure that when you're going from your full copy sandbox to your production sandbox that there are no issues whatsoever. But that's a lot of information. Uh, just understand which sandboxes, what they're called and what they match up to. All right, and then number three is going to be understanding the different ways that you can move and manipulate data within Salesforce. So typically what this is going to be is this is going to be using three different tools. This is going to be the data import wizard, what objects you can use the data import wizard, what limitations as far as data goes on the data import wizard. And then you're gonna wanna understand the data loader and what objects you can use there. A little bit of what the limitations are as far as file sizes go. And this one's going to be the middle option. Um, so you're gonna wanna go from like 50,000 records up to 5 million records on all the objects within Salesforce. And then you're gonna have a third party option on the exam. It's not gonna tell you like, oh, it's this tool that you could use like Workbench or, um, like using Heroku or something like that. This is just going to say, it's just gonna say third party tool. Um, and this is typically going to be used for anything above 5 million records. So you're gonna to wanna to know just kind of the basics, what they're called, what objects you can use, um, what scenarios you wanna use them as far as files go, how many files, how many records that you could use. And then another thing is that if you are changing the data types of your fields, what happens when you are changing your data types? So if you're changing it from one data type to another, will there be any loss of information? Will it completely bug out? Will it not let you? Will what will happen? And what will be the consequences of changing that data type? And then number four is going to be customizing lightning pages and the different components that you might use within your lightning page. Not anything 
custom or out of the ordinary or typically third party, but just what the basics are when it comes to lightning pages and what you can add. So when I think of lightning pages, I think of like a lead page where you can have different collapsible sections and you can have your different related lists. You can have chatter, you can have, I'm trying to think, uh, you can add in, now you can add in AI tools, like an AI chatbot component. You can add in different components to your lightning pages. So you don't necessarily have to know each and every one of them by heart. Just know what they do, what the different pieces are, know where you're dragging them onto, that kind of thing. And then finally, you're gonna wanna understand the differences between lookup relationships and master detail relationships and their different intricacies. Um, this was one that I did not know until I had taken this exam and I was talking with Jeremy about it my husband who is also to Salesforce and many of you guys know, <laughs> but he was like, I can't believe that you passed the admin exam without knowing those differences. I must have gotten really lucky with the admin exam, but understanding the difference between the lookup relationship and the master detail relationship is very crucial when it comes to the data model within Salesforce. So lookup relationships are, um, are a looser type of relationship. We can have two records independent of each other, but they link back and forth to one another. And you can have one of them be like completely absent on a record. Whereas a master detail relationship also categorized typically as a parent child relationship. You're gonna want to have it where each record has a matching record for another one. So I like to think of this in like a project management space of, so typically you're going to have a master detail relationship in a project management where you might have an object that is all about the project and it gives you all the information about the project that you're going to need to know. And then you'll have a sub object that is going to be uh, the detail object. That's not going to be the master object, but again, the detail object and it's going to be tasks. So what are the different tasks that you'll need to complete to complete that project? And then you'll have those listed. You cannot have a task without a project. And that's really important to the master detail relationship. So that's a little bit of the background there. But there are again, a lot of intricacies that you'll need to definitely know for the exam because it'll come up a lot. Um, you'll wanna know how uh, roll-up summary fields relate to each of these and what can happen if you change from one type of relationship to the other type of relationship. Um, that's really important as well. So I would study those pretty heftily when it came to the exam. But with that being said, that's gonna be the top five that I would recommend that you study in order to help you to pass. Um, you may not pass with just understanding these five. Um, you'll need to understand a lot to pass the exam. And this was one of the more difficult exams that I've taken. But again, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you found it helpful. If you did, be sure to give it a like, subscribe. You can connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter. And hey, I am now a LinkedIn Learning Instructor. So you can check out some of my courses over there on LinkedIn Learning if you happen to have access to that. But thank you so much. I'll catch you guys in the next one.